Hi, I'm Park Howell, and welcome to The Business of Story, where purpose-driven people like you learn how to craft and tell compelling stories to grow your revenue and amplify your impact. If you would like to clarify your story in under 30 minutes, visit me at businessofstory.com because you got to own your story to grow your brand. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Man, oh man, have we got a special treat for you on today's Business of Story. We have Colombian Academy Award-winning Best Actress, Paola Baldione. She shares how she got her start at the ripe old age of four years old in her parents' puppet show in Europe, and then found her pace as a young starlet in Colombia, where she began making her mark in TV and film roles. Paola now resides with her husband, Jamie, in Hollywood, and the two of them are about to set off on her most ambitious film project yet. She and Jamie are about to traverse America in a motorhome, making a documentary on immigration to help Americans discover where they actually come from, and you can be a part of the production. That's right, you can be in the movie. I'll let Paola tell you all about it as she imparts important lessons about truly knowing yourself, appreciating your own origin story and how to use it to make an epic impact in the world. You're going to love her insight. You're going to love her energy. But most of all, you're going to love her fiery passion. So let's get started. Paola, welcome to The Business of Story. Thank you so much for having me in your show. It's so great to have you now. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about your history and how you became, well, I guess, a, a best actress? Uh, and won the <laughs> Academy Award for Best Actress in Colombia. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself uh, and how I step into the filmmaking world. Um, I was born in Paris and I lived there for about two, three years. And then when I was three years old, me and my parents, we moved to Italy. And I lived in Italy until I was 11 years old. And at this time of my life, um, my dad and my mom, they, are, they were both artists, they still are, and they had created this uh, a marionette theater. And they started performing the streets everywhere. And what they do, they, they set up the show, set up the theater, set up the puppets. And they're like, they were big size puppets. And because I was so small, I, I was helping them in the show. Sometimes I was a puppet, they would put strings on me. And I was Pinocchio or I was the rabbit coming out of the hat. Like, so you I was, actually were a marionette. You were yes, a puppet. Ah. Yes. <laughs> so I was always part of the show. And, and the more I grew, I started to have more, more different types. Tasks. I was able to manage the puppets when I was bigger and I was doing voices and everything started to change. But I think that my approach to performance started very early um, as a kid. I think I was five, six years old when I started to, to act in the streets of Italy. <laughs> and after that, when I was 11, we moved to Colombia because both of my parents are from Colombia and they wanted to go back and uh, live with their families. And we moved to Colombia. I started to study um, Italian high school, so I wouldn't for forget my Italian. And I was always doing um, after theater school or after after school programs all related to performance and dance. Um, and I also started to take acting classes as, in a, as a professional level. And I started that as a teenager. And when I was 17 years old, um, I, there was an audition for this role in a TV series. And it was my first audition. And I did it and I got it right away. <laughs> so that was very exciting. <laughs> now, now, did you have much training before this or was it all pretty much street performing? It was a lot of street performing and I had been training uh, at a theater school for the past two years prior to this audition. So yes, I, ha I had training, not, not in a film 
or a TV set. All my training was very theatrical. So this was my first experience being on a set. And it was great. I worked for two years in this TV show and it opened doors uh, to other shows and other projects. And I really learned my craft working. Uh, I know some people go to school to learn how to act in front of the camera or do this, but I was lucky enough that my training at that moment came from the field. Um, I knew how to I know about lights and microphone and where to sit. Like there's so many technicalities as, as an actor. If you've never done it before, if you come from theater, it's very tricky to try to look natural and act natural, having keep, keeping in mind all these tiny little things that are around you. But yeah, my, edu my education, that, that's how I started my real education as a professional actress uh, at that level. And then I moved to the States because I wanted to continue studying. Uh, I wanted to study method acting. I wanted to dive deep um, into all this. And um, I studied with uh, Jutta Hagen in, at her studio. I studied Estella Adler's uh, uh, I mean, Estella in her studio. And then I went to Montreal. <laughs> I kept traveling uh, again to keep furthering my studies. I studied at Concordia University. I studied theater and film. And that's when I got my bachelor degree. And while I was studying, uh, there was an audition for this role called, uh, this movie called Portraits in a Sea of Lies, Retratos en un Mar de Mentiras. And I auditioned and I got the role. And a year later, um, I won Best Actress in my country. This is the, the award you were talking about. And how old were you then? Uh, when I, when we shot the movie, when this, I was 25. 25. Yeah. yeah. So, boy, that's quite a career starting young as a marionette, a puppet in the streets of Italy, and then yeah. getting Columbia's <laughs> Best Actress Award by 25. Let me ask you, when you were first studying and you said you learned so much from, you know, the, the, the road of hard knocks, what were some of the things that really struck you, the learnings in being a great actress before you got into actually studying it? So what are those th some of the things that you learned just by doing? Just was, when I was um, on set already? Is that yeah, what you were saying? Yeah, when you said you got that role in a, the TV show mm -hmm. and that really taught you, you didn't have a whole lot of training going into that. So what did you learn from that role? What were one, two, three takeaways that really you've used ever since? What I learned was how to be a professional actress, um, how to be on time, how to be respectful of other people's work, uh, how not to step on other people's work. I really learned about teamwork and how to behave on a set because a lot of people that have no education, they come to a set and they don't know how to be professional. And that's when their career just drops because uh, people are going to remember them. They're not going to call them back, you know? So I think what I took the most was that, like really like uh, be, how to be myself in a set and how to have the respect to the director, to my coworkers, to the makeup artists, to the, uh, you know, to everybody. And, and, and that was very powerful because I didn't, I never came into acting thinking that I wanted to be famous. I came into acting thinking that I wanted to act. Therefore, for me, there wasn't that level of like a celebrity or level of like um, a social status, you know, like everyone in, in, because I was so young, I saw everyone as my, as, as someone who was at my level. And do you have a story you can share with us when you saw that when you were on the set and you saw something happen where oh, maybe another actor actress was misbehaving a bit and wasn't quite as professional as they should have been? <laughs> uh, well, I have from all those years, I can't really remember much about that. Um, but I do have a, a good story to tell you that it was very clear in my mind. And it was actually the first time that I auditioned. Um, it was in these big studios, big rooms, and uh, they have this like... Um, walls they're soundproof so you should you shouldn't be able to hear what the other people are saying in the room right mm -hmm. uh so when i was there i was super nervous because it was my big audition i've never done an audition like this so i went there and i did my monologue and they were like okay that's okay and then they give me a couple of notes and they was like okay now we're gonna do it again and we're gonna play this way and i did it again and when I did it, I guess um, I, the more I started to do it, I started to warm up and feel more comfortable. And I, and I started to improv a lot. And I could hear uh, through the walls the laugh of the director. 
<laughs> so out loud, and uh, and I was thinking, oh well, I'm, I must be doing well <laughs> if I can hear his laugh. And he's notorious. His name is Harold Trompetero. He's a re- he's an amazing director from Colombia. And he's notorious for having this de- very loud, loud laugh. And that's the I think that was the first time I ever met him. I met him through his laugh first, and then I got to see him. Oh, and what was he laughing about? I guess I was just being silly. I was in my audition. I was pretending to come to a set and uh, and auditioning. That was the role. I was pretending to be a teenage girl auditioning for the first time. So I had to be like super excited. And what I did, I started the audition uh, stopping it. Like they would say, okay, record. I was like, oh, um, are we audition? Is, is this for real? Is the camera looking at me? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, yeah. And they thought it, w- it was me being me. And then they got it slowly that I, I was creating a character that had never been on a set before. <laughs> um, that's, that's probably what got you the gig. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Great. So now you're living in Hollywood. Uh, what are some of the movies or TV shows you're doing currently? Uh, well, I shot a couple of movies last year. Um, I shot a movie called The Long Home. Uh, it's directed, written, and produced by James Franco. Um, it's supposed to come out at the end of this year. Um, and then I also shot a movie in El Salvador uh, called Pablo's Word, La Palabra de Pablo, uh, where I play the lead. And this movie is, is coming out also at the end of the year. So these are my two projects as an actress that I have. Then I have my other project as a filmmaker um, that I'm in right now in pre-production and we start shooting in a month. And can you tell us about that project? Yes, it's called I Am Migration. Um, a couple of months ago, I think it was exactly two months to the date, uh, I, made a, uh, I made a short video called I Am Migration. It's a minute long. Um, and it was me after doing a DNA test and receiving all my feedback of my ethnicities back. I did a video embracing all my ethnicities with different costumes and different makeup. Um, and my husband, Jamie, he helped me shoot the video and when we put it on that on, online it went viral on facebook and it made 17.5 million views in a week in a week yes <laughs> what, do you, what do you think it was and i've seen the video it's beautiful in fact if uh, for all your listeners if you want to jump over to the show notes you can pull it up and and we have the video there for you but what do you think it was that intrigued so so many people 17 million people to watch that thing within one week well, I think there was very elements to it. I think first, um, the video in the end has a hashtag saying I am migration uh, and then a little descriptions that I wrote uh, seeing how I felt about immigration and, you know, different ethnicities in this country. So I think because the timing, it was, you know, right after the change of president. And I think the immigration um, theme is very hot right now. It's a very mm-hmm. hot topic uh, worldwide. Um, and just as uh, just to show you this, the the biggest audience that I have, I think the peop- the most people that share it were from France. Like I got a lot of press from France. Everybody was very interested, and that was because the video was released a couple of days, or, or like a week before the elections. So for them, it was very important um, that video because uh, the the other candidate for presidency was very much against immigration. So there was a lot of response from Europe at that moment because of the political situation, and of course. A lot of response in America because of our political situation. So I think that that helped uh, the issue going viral. But I think also it was the fact that it, I think it was very simple. The video it was very digestible, and I think the message was very direct. Um, and I think that's what made it, uh, you know, uh, viral. And if you haven't seen it yet, it is really, it's, it's very beautiful. Number one, we have a very beautiful actress to look at in the <laughs> video to watch. But when you come out in all of your different ethnic garb and you hold up, then what percentage of that ethnicity you are, it's pretty amazing. Were you surprised? I went through it, by the way, and I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different yes. ethnicities yeah. that make you up. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that make me me. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> and also because I felt like every time I had a change of costume and would get into the character, I could feel 
that part of my ethnicity coming out. And even when I look at the video, I, I recognize myself in these different characters. It was like, oh, I could be this person. And, you know, I could be Polynesian. I could be Middle Eastern. Uh, so that was for me, was, it, was, it, it was for me a personal project to discover myself, but it was also a public project for people to see that we are, we're all a mix in the mm -hmm. end. <laughs> mm -hmm. There is not such thing as a 100% pure race. Uh, and we all come from migration. So I think, I think that's, a, that's the beauty of it. So when you did put on a costume and you felt like you, that, that race, that ethnicity started coming out in you, did you feel like that was you as an actress? Or did it feel like you as Paola? I mean, your, your human goodness. I think it felt it felt more like my human me <laughs> for a yeah. second, and and I love that. I love feeling that I could, I, I, you know, maybe in my past lives or generations, I, w I was part of that. That's why my my ethnic backgrounds. That's where my ancestors came from. So I think I felt a little bit of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, silly in my sound. Uh. So you've had a chance to travel the world. You've made a lot of movies, and now you've you're on this cause. I am migration, and it's. Hashtag I am migration, right? And I think you even have a website, I am migration.com, mm -hmm. so that you can. So, what made you ultimately want to do this? What triggered this in you to go after and start this project? And did you always see it uh, to become as big as it looks like it's going to become? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, right after the elections in January, uh, me and my husband, Jamie, uh, we were very in distress. <laughs> we didn't know, we didn't expect uh, this president to be the president of the United States. So we were very in distress and we didn't, and I am an immigrant. I am, I consider myself Latina. I have been an immigrant in this country for the last 15 years. Uh, my husband, he's Australian. He's also an immigrant in this country. I, I have a green card holder. He's in a working visa for the last 16 years almost. So for us, it was very impactful. Like we're all immigrants living in this country, but also we are privileged artists and immigrants that, and I felt like as that, it was in, it was our due, you know, it was in our core to do something about it. Because if we have a voice, if we, if we are at that level of having a voice to communicate an issue, I felt like it was our responsibility to let that voice out and speak for other people that cannot speak um, because of the political situation. And so we talked about it. And I remember I, over dinner, I remember it was our honeymoon, uh, and it was over dinner and we were drinking a little bit. So <laughs> we got a little bit heated. <laughs> and then I told him like, we should do something. We should do a documentary. We should cross the original idea. I, I tell, I told him like, we should cross the border and document and record people that have crossed the border before and record their travel. And why did they do it? Um, just, just to humanize immigrants and to see what, because so many people say like, oh yeah, immigrants come to the, this country and take our jobs and do this, or, you know, the media and the politicians have been depicting immigrants as a threat to our society. So I wanted to do the opposite. I wanted to humanize immigrants and show them why do people come to this country? What's the real reason, you know? And so that was our idea. And I remember Jamie said to me, she was like, oh yes, that's a great idea. You know what? We should cross the border illegally and document this. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, we can go to jail. We can get shot. He was, <laughs> was like, well, say it, hopefully not get shot in the process. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I, that I told him. That one was like, well, we could get to jail. We could get shot. We could get deported. So many things could, could happen. He was like, well, if you really feel so passionate about this, we should go all four. <laughs> and so at that moment, it's not a conversation I wanted to have on my honeymoon, <laughs> trying to think that, oh my God, my lovely new husband is going to get shot in a couple of months. <laughs> so, we let that sit for a while and then and then when I did the viral video uh, we had three DNA companies reaching out to us and the, saying we want to sponsor you we saw your video we want to sponsor whatever other project you're doing um, and so we finally decided to partner up with my heritage DNA and they give us 400 DNA tests to give away in this trip. And at that moment, uh, the story of our documentary changed. And I think like this film has been taking its so it has been growing by itself. It almost does whatever he wants to do or she wants to do. I don't know how to call it. <laughs> <laughs> but it changed a lot because the, then I realized that yes, crossing the border was an issue, but also we wanted to talk about the 
the immigration that has been happening in America through centuries. And since we had this DNA test, I, we said like, well, why don't we go test people all across the country, uh, different people, because America was built by different ethnicities and immigrants and see where they come from. And so it, it would be an experience for us to get to discover America and also an opportunity for America to discover its own roots uh, and see where they come from. And, I, and I'm very interested in to meet people that have no idea where they come from or even people that believe to be 100% American. But then once they do the test, they can realize that maybe they're not. I love that. So it's an opportunity for you to discover America and for America to discover where it actually comes from. Exactly. Exactly. Huh. Well, now I can see why that that uh, director was laughing after hearing your passion and hearing you going on. <laughs> so let me slow down one second. So you created this. You decided, OK, let's throw that film of crossing the border, con that concept out the window, and mm. let's use our voices to be able to do more of an art project, but very much of a visual storytelling art project that you could mm -hmm. do on YouTube, a one minute video that takes people and gets them dressed up in their native garb per their DNA test. You put it out there one week before the election in France, you get <laughs> 17 million views. You're like, whoa, we're onto something here. You also have sponsors start showing up at your doorstep and you get my heritage DNA that steps in, gives you 400 DNA tests. So now what you are going to travel across the country, have people do their DNA tests and then shoot them? Are they going to become a part of your video? Or what happens after that? Yes. The, so the idea of the documentary, we are going to rent an RV for two months. It's going to be me, my husband, and uh, two, uh, a cameraman. His name is Lucas Cristo. And uh, his assistant, which happens to be his girlfriend too, her name is Angelica Blandon. She's a very, very talented and really well-known actress from Colombia. So they're coming as a crew to help us out. And it's going to be the four of us on the road for two months. We start from uh, Patterson, New Jersey. Um, we spend a, a couple of days there. We find people uh, that are interested in knowing their, you know, their roots, and we give the, we test them. Then we move to another city. We go to Wheeling in West Virginia, then Independence, Missouri, then Brigham City, Utah, and finally we make it to Truckee, California. So it's five cities that we're gonna be traveling and giving DNA tests, and also we're gonna have like radio interviews and just like talking to people about what we're doing. And then on the we have to wait a couple of weeks for the DNA tests to come back, the results. And after the two weeks, we're gonna go back and do exactly the same route, but the opposite way, and and give the test, the results to the people and record their reactions. So, uh, so you are going to, when, when do you leave, by the way, when, when are you leaving Patterson, New Jersey? Uh, we will be in Patterson on August 8th. On August 8th. And so you're going to spend a month traveling cross country, handing out the test, talking to people, mm -hmm. um, and then you're going to get the results, come back, give them results, and then shoot them when they learn, videotape them, film them mm -hmm. when they learn who they are, or where they came from. Exactly. Wow, that sounds like quite a road trip. Now, why aren't you coming through Phoenix, Arizona? I would love to be a part of this thing. <laughs> oh, I would love to. But the thing is, like, we uh, we are working with a historian, um, and he's very passionate about the project, very passionate about the history in America. So we we had a couple of brainstorming meetings with him, and we decided that we wanted to find cities that they were very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and that also had like some historical relevance uh, of immigration or, or, you know, something that was important f for American history or the building of this city. And mm -hmm. so that's why we came around these five cities. It was a mix of, of all these things. Well, and then you end up in Truckee, California. So yeah. I've got another potential sponsor for you who's just outside of Truckee down in Sacramento, actually Davis, California. Uh, their name is Avant Page or a Vant page, depending on how European you want to get with it. I've had a chance to work with these folks. Luis Miguel heads this up, and it's an amazing translation firm, and they do work. Their whole mission is to help immigrants truly uh, realize their American dream by translating and helping them not just understand an issue, but to overstand an issue. 
And by overstanding, this is a term that came out of the late 60s, early 70s, and is certainly in the hip hop arena. And it's just not enough to understand what's going down. You need to overstand it to truly appreciate the implications of it especially as it applies to you and your life and your family. And I told them about the work you are doing with I Am Migration, and they were very, very interested because essentially they are translation folks, professional services firms, but they are activists for immigrants and given everything that's been going on in America and in some places around the world, nationalism and this push against immigrants, they are very much like you, that Mm. they want to stand up for what's right and help through this translation service to make sure that immigrants truly overstand what's going on. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, they're great. We did work them through the whole story cycle system, and I had the great honor of of helping them devise their fundamentals to their brand story, and we're just now in the throes of bringing that to life through their website and materials and so forth. But um, when we landed and found this overstanding concept, it was so critical to finding the hook within their brand, and it's kind of what you're talking about, too, It's not enough just to help people understand that they're immigrants and that maybe they came from other places. But with your particular project, you're helping them overstand, like Mm. in your case, overstand the fact that you have 10 different nationalities or ethnicities that make up you when before you probably thought there was only one, two or three, maybe. Yeah. And how does that how does that impact you? And how do you think it's going to impact the people that you are interviewing in your documentary? Well, I, 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 I don't know how it's going to impact. I know it's going to, as every project I do, I, I just dive in with the most positive energy. But I usually what I get at the end is very different than what I thought I was going to get of my expectations. So I feel like this trip is going to, first of all, open my eyes to, to different things. Cause I've never, I mean, I've, I've traveled, but never cross country, never, never on, on a car. And it's very different when you fly than when you actually do a road trip, cause you really get to see the landscape and you stop and you talk to the people. So I think that for me, it's going to, for me and for my husband, Jamie, it's going to be very, very interesting to, to dis- rediscover America mm-hmm. uh, through different eyes. And um, and I don't know about the people who because I we don't we still don't know who we're, we're gonna find yet. So we're tr- we're trying to to find some people before uh, a couple of people before just to make sure we we have people interested in being part of the project and being interviewed. But we're also gonna go and and just find people as we go. Um, yeah. So that's gonna be very interesting to see who's who's gonna want to be part of the project, where they come from. So I still I cannot really answer you that question because everything mm-hmm. is up in the air. And as I said, <laughs> this documentary it's. It's, it's taking its own form. Uh, as much as I try, I, I see it like a like a little beast. As much as I try to tease it and to tame it, it's it's it does its own thing in the end. Isn't that the truth though? With any big movement or project or film that you're on, when you get into it, you have a vision of what you want it to do, but then it takes on a life of its own. Yes, yes, very much. And as an actress, more because as an actress. Uh, what I've what I've been learning through the years is that I am just a part of the puzzle, and uh, I'm not I'm not the big picture. And that's 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 when the ego and everything comes up and about. But if you realize as an actor that you're just a, a a a piece of the puzzle, you know, then you don't get to see the whole art being complete until the end, and you don't even know what how is looking or what's the director thinking, <laughs> really, until you see the finished product. Mm-hmm. Um, so that has been happening all my life. It's always a surprise because usually we, usually we don't really see much pre-hand. Uh, usually you see the final project when you actually sit in the movie theater for the first time. So you got to see your big face in front of everybody <laughs> <laughs> and maybe be embarrassed a little bit. <laughs> so, so Paola, take us to that moment when you did your D- DNA test and you opened it up, found the results, and you saw all these different ethnicities inside of you that made you uniquely who you are. What did that feel like? Take us to that moment. Well, I I knew I was gonna, my last name is Fischer, um, which comes from Germany. My grandfather uh, was from Germany. And my grandfather, this is from my um, from my mom's side, She is she's from Bolivia. And then from my father's side, I know they have been from Colombia for 
different generation, but we don't really know much about their ancestors, they really ancestry. So I knew I was going to have some European uh, German. I thought it was going to be like a mix of German um, and then some Central American roots. Uh, but that was pretty much about it. Uh, I didn't know what else I was going to encounter. And then when I see that I was so mixed, it was a beautiful surprise <laughs> for me <laughs> because like, because I've moved through so many years. I've been in so many different cities and I, w I, I was born and I was spoke French and then Italian and then Spanish and then English. And I feel like I've, as an actor too, I've metamorphed myself into different cultures, which also has its pros and its cons because I never really felt like I belong to one place or like I don't have like a favorite soccer team or like I, I've never had this like feeling of, of patriotism or like belonging to one nationality um which which sometimes i i lack it's like oh i wish i could be more into one one thing but at the same time it has opened myself to be more social and more open towards people you know in different cultures so it's 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 in for me that's what i'm saying also this documentary i think is going to be very reflective of like me you know Mm -hmm. Will you also have your um, subjects, if you will, will they be getting into costume when they're talking about the different kinds of uh, people, places, ethnicities they are? No, I don't think I don't think for this one we will do it this way. I think I really want to get an intimate picture of who they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I really want to spend the time we have, like getting to know them and and why, you know, when do they came to the States or when do their ancestry came to the state? I really want to get to show them this is a documentary for them and I really want to get to know them. So I don't think we will be doing the character interpretation this time. Have you ever done anything quite like this before? No. <laughs> so this is your no. first adventure into the purpose-driven world of creating a movement on your own to see what's going to come of it? Yes, as, <laughs> as Jamie, he was saying, my husband was saying, this is our year to be activists, he said. And then that's it, then we can do whatever you want. <laughs> but this is the year of activism. So we took it that way. And I, and as I said, I, wasn't, I, I knew I wanted to shoot a documentary, but I wasn't expecting to everything to unfold so beautifully because of the viral video. Uh, so that's a good omen. I take it as a good omen. I think it is, too. Now, your husband, Jamie, he is a bit of a performance artist or street artist. I'm not sure what sort of category yeah, or even yeah. if I should put him into a category. Yeah, I don't Tell think you can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Jamie, Jamie is, a, is an artist and a street artist. He's from Australia. Um, he also is a restaurant owner. He has a beautiful restaurant in Brooklyn called Northern Territory. He's an Australian restaurant. Um, and... Among that, he also does a lot of social work. He works for the United Nations. Um, and right now he has a project in El Salvador with the United Nations and the World Fruit Program, where he creates um, street art festivals. So it's a street art program where they work with, um, with travel kids, you know, from like really like underdeveloped neighborhoods or like kids that are around uh, gun violence and gangs. And so they work with these young kids and they teach them how to do art, how to do street art, how to do social media, how to use a drone. Like they give them all these tools so they can take them away from, you know, from their their surroundings and also give them an education but also what they do they also give them a voucher for a year where they can go to a supermarket and get free food so they can feed themselves and their families mm. um it's very interesting and at the same time he works with the mayor and what they do they take uh, they work in places that um that have been like in that are in very bad shape or like people or tourism they don't really want to be, be there because there is you know violence or you know it's not a really well-known neighborhood and what they do they paint the walls the last last thing what they did they paint a whole uh, supermarket a, a massive supermarket and they they street artists so they they brought international artists uh, but they also work with with artists from El Salvador and they work with the kids and so the international artists and the Salvadorian artists they teach the kids and they work together to create this beautiful mural and what it does is beautifies the city therefore it brings more tourism and it also brings uh, more economy to the country wow so I can just see, picture being at the dinner table on your honeymoon and you two 
having a few cocktails in you, start getting into your passion through acting and filmmaking and his passion, obviously, for um, helping folks and coming together in this big I am immigration movement. It yeah, and really actually, like, yeah, because like I've worked with him in the past on his project and he has helped me out on my project, but we have never really worked, we have never really created a project together. So this is mm -hmm. our first project actually working together. So we'll see if we don't kill each other. <laughs> well, yeah, now, now look at this. This uh, marriage is only about six months old, so you yes. got to take it easy. <laughs> take it easy, take it easy. But I mean, the good thing, the good thing, I know many people know my history with Jamie. One day I'll write a book, but we have known each other for 14 years. Ah, that helps. So we have a long friendship and different stories. So that helps. So we know each other. We already know how we're going to be on the road, hopefully. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. Well, Paola, how can people learn more about you and the work you're doing in I Am Migration? And is there anything that people can be doing right now as you get underway filming your documentary that they can assist you with? Yes. Well, the um, I Am Migration, as you said it before, we have a website. It's uh, www.iammigration.com. Our Instagram and our Facebook page is I Am Migration. We also have a Twitter account, which is I Am Migration USA. Uh, then if you want, you can also follow my husband, uh, his account is on Instagram is Mr. M R Tall, T O W -L, L. And my name and my Instagram account is Paola Baldion. Um, and right now, what we're doing is we, we're trying to reach people from these five cities and trying to see who will be interested in participating in this documentary and knowing their roots. So maybe if, if, if there are some listeners that are from Patterson or, you know, Wheeling, Independence, Brigham or Truckee, um, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Right now, what we need is casting. We're casting the people to be in our documentary. You need casting. And so the best way for them to reach out is through your social channels you just gave or do you mm -hmm. have an email that you would like to share yes and the email is info at i am migration.com info at i am migration dot com. Dot com. and what great. and my and to your second question my advice what i learned with this viral video is that um nowadays we have no excuse not to get our content out um before you know, before when digital wasn't around, we had we had to do film. It was so expensive, you know, to be a filmmaker. Um, but right now there is no excuse. Like I, I shot that video on my iPhone and I edited it on my iPhone. I mean, Jamie, uh, sorry, Jamie shot it on the iPhone and then I edited it on the iPhone. It was all done on an iPhone and then we put it in social media and then it just blew up. And and also last year I, I, I did a short film, a five minutes film, to this film festival in Colombia, which is called Smart Films. And it's a film festival all done with cell phones. Mm. So what I take it about this experience is that if you have a very important message, if you are a storyteller and you want to, you know, the people to see it, you can use social media, media for it. You don't need to spend big money, you know, making a movie or anything like that. Like the means it's so easy nowadays. If you have a great idea, just grab your phone and go for it. Like that's, that's my lesson. And that's my advice I can give to new, new storytellers. So we have no excuse and we get the likes of Donald Trump up there pounding his fists. I, I don't know that you could paint a better villain for many, many, many different subjects and movements. Um, and we have the rocks in our slings, which are our iPhones, to be able to go out. And if you want to be a storyteller, a visual storyteller, a filmmaker, you have no more excuses. You put that iPhone in your sling, make your show and then throw it out for the world to see and react to. Yes, yes, exactly. That's the that's sort of learning the power of social media. It's giving everybody a voice, even if you don't have, you know, the means to make a, you know, a, a film, a high budget film, you have your cell phone to do it. So it's no excuse to not to be a storyteller in this century. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Then my final question to you, do you have any secrets to storytelling? And maybe it's filmmaking or maybe it's filmmaking on your iPhone. But what are the one, two or three things people should do to make sure that what they're shooting is actually going to resonate? Well, I think first, you should always be very passionate about what you're trying to tell. Uh, I think that's the most important thing, because if you're passionate about your idea, then everything else flows. Uh, if you're not really that sure or if you're doing a project, you know, for 
somebody else or something that is not really your call, then that's going to that's going to be seen in the final product. But I think the first the first one is being passionate about it. And then I think from there, everything flow, like find something that you know about too. Like, um, for example, when I write films or do things like that, I, I take a lot of, of my personal history or what happened to me. Like, I would say if you're beginning, talk about something that you know, you know, and it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be your life experiences, could be your friend, could be your mom, whatever it is that you feel very close that where your heart is. And then that will open up the rest. Uh, great advice. And it sounds like I Am Migration fits perfectly into both of those categories for you. I hear the passion in your voice and what you learned in your own process. You're now going to take it out to America to help America understand where it comes from. I hope you get a chance to get to the White House and see if you can get Trump to do a DNA test. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, let's put the call out there. You know, hopefully his let's minions are listening there. to the show. And, hey, uh, I have 400 tests. I'm very more than happy to give one to Mr. Trump, although he can pay for his own test. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should maybe you should mail one. Sean Spicer, send it to Sean and see if he can exactly. work it into the crowd. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Paola, thank you so much for being here on Businesses Story. Really appreciate you taking the time. I imagine you're quite busy leading up to the big uh, RV launch across America to shoot your I Am Migration documentary. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for having, having me in your podcast. All right. Well, good luck, and we'll keep an eye out and let us know how the show is going. Maybe I can get you to give me a call from the road, and we can do a little update podcast on the road, and you can tell our listeners what you're finding in the process. Oh, I think that's a great idea. I think that would be a great idea because also on the way back, because we're also we're only shooting the reactions of the people, we're going to have more free time. So we're doing actually all our media and like radio station and TV station visits on the way back. So maybe I can schedule it in and we can drop in. <laughs> That would be great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for listening to this edition of The Business of Story. So great to have you here. You know, I'm doing something now in the show, and I'm only going to do it for a limited time because I only have so much time. I'm rather limited as well. But now you can register for a free impact call. And what I mean by that is go to businessofstory.com. It's going to ask you to fill out the briefest of forms. So you're going to give me a little bit more idea about you, your organization, and what is the purpose that drives you. Much like what Paola is doing with her I Am Immigration, she has a real purpose-driven mission at hand. I want to know what drives you in your organization. And then once I get that download, I'll get back to you. We'll set up a 30-minute call, and I guarantee that I can help you clarify your story to put a fine tooth focus on your purpose driven story so that you can get your people aligned, you can grow your revenue and ultimately have a much greater amplified impact in the world. That's my promise to you. It's the most invaluable free advice you're ever going to get. So visit me over at businessofstory.com and set up your impact call today. Also join us next week when we will have another amazing story artist like Paola for you to learn how to craft and tell compelling stories that sell so that you can advance your social initiatives further faster. Until then, I just hope you have the most wonderful life. See you then.